Come on. Comcast. Do you guys, do you guys see me correctly? Because like my preview looks terrible. I'm having some technical difficulties, but my streaming software looks right. But my preview only shows like the top of my head. <laughs> so I hope you guys see everything correctly. <sighs> it's been a day. I've had some technical difficulties. I got in like a slightly more than five minutes ago. Uh, hence why we're late to start. And then uh, things decided to like go crazy. So yeah. All right. Let me uh, get my brain in gear here as I've like panicked trying to get things to work. <laughs> uh, before we started, I just want to I want to say a little little thanks, Clay D, becoming a new member. Appreciate it. Welcome, welcome, welcome. Uh, you're a student McGill, so make sure you find if you want to join. That is your Discord invite should be should get it automatically. I think. If not, shoot me an email. We'll get you fixed up. Okay, I'll talk about our topic, and I know this tank's loud. I know the water level's low. Somebody's going to say it in chat. I know, I know, I know. I, my life has been insane the last week and a half. <laughs> um, so, I want to talk about epiphyte plants and why I think, generically speaking, they're just the best plant. And, and let me explain. I, I get questions all the time about, like, what plants do you suggest for this setup or that setup? Or, um, hey, I'm trying to do some combination, right, that usually isn't the standard we think of. Like, maybe some Af smaller African cichlids with plants. Or, um, I want to put lots of sand in, but I want good plants to go with it. And this is where I think, like, epiphytes are just incredible, because, right, we epiphytes are all, for those who don't know the term epiphyte, epiphyte is any plant that lives non-parasitically onto something else. So typically this is like, think like moss on trees or how like ivy will grow up on tree trunks. In the case of our aquariums, these are things like java fern, anubias, boos, Bulbitis, technically. Uh, another plant that a lot of people don't think is an epiphyte, but actually it really is, in the grand scheme of things, is uh, Hygrophila pinnatifida, or pinnatifida, depending on how you decide to pronounce it. I like fida, and maybe that's just because uh, I'm, I'm American and I pronounce things horribly. <laughs> um, but a lot of these plants, the beauty of these things is that their roots attach to plants very strongly, right? And then they feed off the water column and can be put kind of anywhere. Like one of the things I love, and you guys have seen this in my guppy mansion and like, had I been more prepared and not uh, working my brains out and literally like uh, driving at speeds, I probably shouldn't have on the highway in order to get home close to on time and not be ridiculously late. Uh, <laughs> you guys have seen like all the Java fern Wendelov I do in my guppy mansion. Right. And that was all put into choya wood. And it looks incredible, although I've had a problem with it recently. <laughs> That's just because the choya wood deteriorates much faster than other driftwoods. But, like, rock and driftwood we can attach things to. You can even attach things to, like, if you got your SpongeBob, uh, you know, the, the pineapple hut, right? You can attach epiphyte plants to the pineapple hut if you really want to. You could have, like, a, a pirate ship, you know, those big broken ones that cost you, like, $700 or whatever ridiculous price tag they are nowadays. I remember when I was in my, you know, younger childhood in the 80s, and you could get those things, and they were like 50 bucks. <laughs> but now, you know, those like those big, huge, honking ornamentations that you can get for your tank, right? Those big, like, decorative, neat things that most of us think are kind of tacky. Um, I oddly like certain ones. <laughs> I mean, it's just because it's like memories of being a kid. But, like, you can attach epiphyte plants to those, and they'll do well as long as we have the right stuff in the water, right? We have decent fertilization. Uh, we have okay light. But the best part is that most of our epiphyte plants, like, they live in areas naturally where they're a little more shaded. Typically, they're not getting super direct light. They tend to be on, like, the shoreline or something like that. 
or uh, like Boos and um, Piptospatha, which is a, a lesser known epiphyte plant, mostly because it can be a little difficult to keep fully submerged. These, these exist in areas where the water changes height like crazy, right? So you could have like a three foot deep creek today and, and this is usually in monsoon season out where in Borneo and stuff where these plants are. And then tomorrow you could have these insane like monsoon rains happen and now it's six foot deep and all your plants are completely underwater. And then two days from now, the weather stays dry and there's no additional rainfall and that it comes back down, right? Because it, it all drains out and it goes where it needs to go. And now these plants are back on the rock surface where most of their leafage is out in the atmosphere and they've got just their roots barely in the water. You know, these, these plants are typically really tough. Not always like boost, for example, uh, you know, there's the dreaded like boost melts that we always deal with where like, Oh, I moved it like a quarter of an inch. It might melt its leaves off. <laughs> but a lot of this just comes from these plants are uh, in the wild, very typically in, a immersed system, right? So the roots are underwater and the leaves are above water. Although some live in like floodplains and stuff like that, where it depends on the time of year. But this leads to the plant overall, like maybe we don't see the leaves all the time, like boost because we get those melt. But the, the rhizome and the structure of the plant is incredibly tough. And that's another reason why these plants are so great, right? Because they're beginner friendly. You can make some mistakes and they'll live through them. You can forget to fertilize for a week. They'll be fine. They can get extremely low light. In some cases, some of those plants even thrive in extremely low light. And they do okay. They're not very high demand. And yet, they're very flexible in how we can use them. You know, I've seen java ferns and anubiuses in extremely hard water, where you're talking like Lake Tanganyika and cichlids, where it's like pH 9... And it's just tons and tons and tons of stuff and, and minerals in the water. And then you see them in like a tank that's designed for discus that's kind of acidic, right? You, you, they have so much flexibility and a lot of other plants can't handle both sides of the range. They'll, they like that soft water and you start getting to slightly hard water and those slightly more alkaline pHs at 7.4 or 7.6. And you get that combination of alkaline pH and, and much more minerals. And they kind of start to not be as happy... Uh, and, and plants can adjust. Don't get me wrong. There are plenty of people who do lots of stuff. But all the epiphyte plants, like, don't care. The, the only, like, downside, let's put this out there, is that a lot of times some of those epiphyte plants have a, a lesser understood part of how they thrive. So examples would be, we don't understand how anubius rot occurs, right? We don't understand how to prevent it. We don't understand exactly what it is and how to protect against it. Uh, Java fern, like, I've, I know Ginger Graves, who I, I love to death, right? She's been around forever. I've got to meet her in person. She's fantastic. She is, like, notorious, famous. You pick your, your choice for having trouble with Java fern. And almost guaranteed, it's because there's like this not really well-spoken thing that Java fern loves potassium. And potassium is not commonly in our water. Even even like mineral-rich well water, potassium is just not something that tends to be in water. We have to add it. So in order to thrive with those plants, we often don't know that like we're missing one little thing they need, right? There's, there's crazy little things like that where it's, it's just hard to know unless you've like you've talked with enough people or you've just been around long enough where you pick up these little things and, and finally they settle in or like you, be like you folks in chat maybe you didn't know like java fern needs extra potassium and if you start seeing problems with your java fern the very first thing to do is dose some potassium and watch what happens because almost always it's some kind of potassium deficiency that shows like something else because that plant is just kind of weird in that way. But you could be in a live stream and randomly hear about that. Like the way that I learned about that was a conversation with my, of all people, my crypt guru, the guy who taught me the grape leaf trick, right? We're sitting there talking. He's like, he's telling me about the grape leaf trick. 
about how he uses grape leaves in his immerse setups, and he learned this from some other person who learned it from this person, and and then he's like, yeah, it's kind of like uh, it's kind of like Java Fern in that way. That it's got the one thing it likes. And what do you mean? And this was like four years ago now. So it was when I was like really starting to ramp up into plants in my my return. Because we're getting close to me being in, back back in the hobby for five years at this point. And he's like, oh yeah, no. Like anybody has trouble with, with uh, Java Fern out here. It's because our water has nothing in it. And they're big potassium hogs. Uh, how come no one in the club has ever said that? Like, of all of our plant psychos, how come no one's ever said that until you're telling me about a trick for crips? And then you, like, you just tangent over to, oh, yeah, it's kind of like Java Fern. Now, it might have been because he had three, three like, super rare Java Ferns growing out in his immersed rig at that time, right? <laughs> he had these, like, super rare ones growing there. And he's just like, yeah, I don't know. But now you know. <laughs> <laughs> like, I and I had had trouble with some Java Fern Wendelov, uh, and just I've never had trouble with them since. Anytime I start to see something, I realize right away like I need to dose potassium in that tank. <laughs> dose a little bit, come right back right as rain. I, you know, it's like little little things like that, but it's part of why epiphytes are great. Is it like, let me give you that example, right? Those Java Ferns, they're starting to die and starting to die and starting to die, and I was trying to figure out what was wrong. And then they, they stress themselves, and in the case of Java Fern, they're one of the very few plants that has what's called an adventitious child plant. So on the back of our leaves, right, we have those little, little seeds. That's an adventitious child where it basically, almost like a parasite, grows off of its parent when the parent is stressed, typically. And in the case of Java Fern, this is when it's most common to have all the seeds go at once, is when it's stressed. So my Java Fern that was stressed out throughout tons of baby plants. And I didn't recover the initial Java Fern. But I had literally hundreds of baby Java Fern Wendelov, and that is now what populates the Guppy Mansion, is all those baby plants. And ever since I learned that lesson, I've never had problems. And part of it is that that plant is so tough that it lasted like two months of not being happy. And throwing, it's spending all these like natural resources in itself to be able, build all these little baby plants, and it was still going. I could just tell it wasn't happy because like I didn't have that beautiful like lacy look in the Wendelov. Anubius, right? Anubius rot takes forever to consume an entire plant, typically for us, because those plants are so tough. They they're just designed to take things better, and that's why I think honestly. And I'm, someone can challenge me to prove me wrong. I will happy, happily, happily, happily debate this. That epiphytes are the best aquarium plants. Because they're flexible. You can put them anywhere. Whether it's how you plant them. The water parameters. And they can go in practically anything. They're durable. They're very low requirement. And yet, we use them all the time in aquascaping. In these high requirement tanks. Where there's tons of CO2. Super powerful lighting. And all this other like insane planning. What's one of the most common things you see? Java Fern. Anubius. Boos. Bulbitis. Like, I, I don't know a George Farmer tank. That I've ever seen. That doesn't include Java Fern. And almost always like Needle Leaf Java Fern. Right? Or Trident Java Fern. And I love George Farmer. He's the best. That guy's fantastic. Every tank. Every tank there is some. Right? I'm telling you. Epiphytes are the best plants. And uh, there's... there's There are some questions in chat. And so like... Can Java Fern flower? To my knowledge... Not really. <laughs> um... I don't know of any Java Ferns that are flower, and part of that is because where the seeds would be, where you would get something like a flower, is where the adventitious child plants are. Right? So that's 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 one of the things where you, you have this this trouble. Um and, and there's this this other question here that uh are are epiphyte plants a go to for tank filtration? So, yes and no. Let me explain. Uh, and that's that's for uh, Audrey, who's in chat here. So, epiphytes are great 
in the sense that they provide extra room for beneficial bacteria. They, they tend to naturally have large surface areas, right? Uh, if you think about java fern, when java fern gets nice and bushy or anubias, that rhizome just keeps growing, you get lots of leaves and all that stuff, and you kind of get dense leaf structures. Boost is a lot like that. Bulbitis is fantastic because it gets a nice, beautiful, dense leaf structure. It climbs real high. And this provides tons and tons and tons of space for our beneficial bacteria. But because it's so, uh, it's so low demand... It's not going to be something that consumes a ton of ammonia and stuff until you get, like, really large quantities of it. So, yes, in the sense that it has, it provides lots of surface area for our natural beneficial bacteria to propagate, house themselves, that kind of stuff. No, in the sense of the plant itself is not consuming a lot of extra, excess nitrates and things like that because it's pretty low demand. Now, if we do it correctly and we have a lot of it and we have... A tiny amount of CO2 just to boost that intake naturally, yeah, it's going to consume quite a bit. But I would not look at, like, say, water wisteria or water sprite versus a java fern and go, yeah, that java fern is the one that's going to be my high, my nitrate hog, right? It's, it's, it's no contest that the, the wisteria and the water sprite are going to be the nitrate hog. They're going to consume way more out of the water column. But they don't necessarily handle swings in your tank as well. So there's there's advantages to each, right? And me in general, like I like having a little bit of stem with epiphyte. I like mixing my plants. Like I love, I love leaf textures. I love color differences. Uh, I love lots of mixtures of stuff. Most of you guys who've seen my plants, though, you probably just assume all I do is put crypts in tanks. And then lately, Java fern has become more pre prevalent because I've been growing a lot of it. <laughs> but I do, I do like to include a mixture of colors and leaf textures because it's visually appealing to me, right? That's my thing. But if you were to ask me, I want you to do only one category of plant in a tank. It, it wouldn't be uh, rosettes, which is like your crypts. It, it would not be stems. It would be epiphytes because I can do more with it, right? Especially if we're trying to include hardscape. Now, if I'm trying to do something that has no hardscape, eh, it might change a little bit, right? I'm telling you, they're, they're amazing. So let's get some questions. We'll get out of me ranting about just how beautiful and wonderful things are, mostly Java Fern. Because that's my my big one. But Hygrophila pinnatifida is the other one that like is a fantastic uh, epiphyte plant and actually does better as an epiphyte attached to wood, especially attach it to wood because it, those roots will burrow into that wood really well, and they actually use some of the slow decomposition of the wood because that's how they grow naturally. So Hygrophila pinnatifida naturally grows on dead fallen wood. Figure out how it grows in nature. It will help you in your fish tank. Guaranteed. All right. So let's get questions. I just happened to see Cheryl's comment about Pinnatifida. So I, I had to I had to add that little, like, gem for you guys. You know, every time I, like, unintentionally teach you guys lessons that I probably should, like, intentionally do in videos in these streams. It's just, it's just how it goes. <laughs> Stephen P. What's up, buddy? A furt question. Okay. <laughs> Is there any reason why mixing Nylock G dry furts wouldn't work? So you're doing your some of your macros and your micros. So here's the thing. Typically, when we do the full macro and micro, some of the micronutrients can get interfered with by the macronutrients, um, which is why in EI dosing, we alternate where we're only dosing Micros one day, macros the next, micros, macros. We're, we're doing this on purpose so the plants can absorb those without any interference from the others. We use stabilizers, and, and they're very minor. It's very tiny things in our all-in-ones in order to prevent that. So, like, the biggest example is typically in iron. Uh, and the way that we get around that is we use chelated iron, and there's a small stabilizer on top of that that almost no company talks about, but they all use <laughs> in order to prevent... Uh, the macros from interfering with them. However, without phosphate, which is typically the 
problem child, if you will. I don't think so. But my question to you is this, right? Are you saving enough time by mixing that all into one bottle versus dosing them on alternating days? Does it save you enough that you feel it's worth it? Because when we when we deal in powdered, part of the reason why we deal in powdered, other than it saves you a lot of money, right, is that opportunity to really tune and and get our our nutrients exactly where we need them for the tank. Like I'm lazy, I use all in one fertilizers. I and I have tons of EI dose stuff lying around, and I will eventually get to using it. But I, I'm lazy, man. <laughs> I need to be able to like speed fertilize. And you guys know my schedule. It's terrible enough as is. But it, the question is just to you, like, does it, does that time savings by mixing them together instead of having alternating doses actually save you enough? And I know the other question is here using one company's, uh, if maybe the, maybe the, the, the focus is one company's first versus another company's like macro, one company's macro, another company's micro. They're all the same. They're, they're all salts. <laughs> <laughs> that that won't change, right? They're all salts and minerals. That part won't change. Uh, who who manufactures them doesn't change what they are. The formulation is basically the same. They all they all kind of get them from the same places. Uh, Paul Saltero, thank you for the exact uh, specific here. They are ferns are non-flowering plants because they reproduce by way of spores, right? So there and there's a was it sporangium? Sporangia, Kelly Foreman's on that. Uh, that's why. So that's why they also have adventitious child plants, right? Those little spores are an adventitious child. Neat stuff. Yeah, the brain's only so functioning right now. I'm. Uh, it's not. It's not lack of sleep for once. It's actually uh, just work. <laughs> being a, a nightmare show. <laughs> it's been a very very busy day for us. In my uh, my neck of the woods. Let me see here. I, I want to make sure I didn't, like, I had a little skip and chat. I want to make sure I'm not missing something. Do, 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 do. And remember, at Bentley Pasco makes it super easy for me to see your questions. Uh, BCFR Aquatics. I recently moved my Nana Petite in a rock, in a rock wool, and in the bustle of things, some leaves dried some. Some leaves have hole them now. What do I do to save this prized plant? Give it time in its new environment. You can... So, for the leaves that dried up, or uh, or even ones that have holes... So, holes typically is a nutrient deficiency. We can look that up. Um, it's, it's fairly simple. There's a great uh, video by this guy named Bentley, who put out a video all about nutrient deficiencies. I'm kidding. But... Um, yeah, the, the nutrient deficiency for holes, we can look at that and determine whether or not we think that's a nutrient deficiency or just that exposure to drying out. If we think the leaves are dead, what we can do is just clip those leaves off the rhizome and, and don't clip them like right at the rhizome for risk of damaging the rhizome. So like clip them this teeny tiny amount, like a, a couple millimeters above the rhizome. And that will trigger the plant naturally to grow new leaves and, and just give it time. It'll be okay. As long as the rhizome is okay, and those plants can dry for a little bit and will recover. So, like, even if that leaf got a little dry and it's not withering away, it will recover. The The, the beautiful thing about Anubias especially is that it's a super tough plant. It can handle some really wild stuff. And part of that is just because of what it exists in in nature out in Africa. But I wouldn't stress too much about this. Just monitor it, and if you see continuously deteriorated condition, look at the things, the signs in the plant itself for a nutrient deficiency and supplement to account for that. Or if you're seeing those dried leaves start to wither, just clip them. That way it doesn't keep trying to, it wastes too much energy trying to save that, and it gets triggered, oh, this broke, I need to make new leaves. Because that's naturally when we, stems in a lot of plants, when we're trimming a leaf away, we're basically triggering an inherent part of nature that thinks this broke off. I need to regrow. Which is why uh, stem plants, when you clip them, they propagate the way they do. It's just part of how they exist in order to survive and thrive out in nature. 
do 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 uh regina how are you hope you and your family are happy and healthy for the most part we're doing very very well uh my mother who works in the healthcare industry has had to go through the full covid vaccine recently and uh if for many of you who know like the day after you have the covid vaccine you feel terrible and then you kind of recover from that but otherwise we're doing pretty good i'm just uh yeah working <laughs> working we're, we're juggling a lot of stuff at work so there's a lot of like big deadlines and stuff coming up and that is always like a super hectic time for us uh even though we we always do well, but it's always just like a madhouse. A bunch of people running around like like they've lost their heads, even though in the end we, we buckle down. We get it all figured out. <laughs> okay. Oh, chat jumped on me. One sec. Oh, man. I'm going to butcher this, but I'm going to try. Shretza? I know that's wrong. It, it just, I can feel it's wrong. Anyway, my money weren't plant stem is dying, like literally decaying in between the substrate and water. Do you know why it could be? So my first question to you is going to be, is this a relatively new plant? Like, did we buy it from an aquarium store? Maybe it was in a bundle and we put it in our tank and it's starting to decay. If the answer to that is yes, which like 95% of the time, this is the case. That's because those are grown immersed, so they're grown outside of water with only, like, their roots in, and they trim those plants off, right? They just trim them off and sell them, and they keep the rest that's in water to propagate more and more. And that plant is going through conversion. So we just have to give it time, look for the new growth at the top of the plant, because the old growth is all going to kind of slowly die away. The stem should, at a certain point, be okay. And we're going to look for, like, aerial roots, so we're going to look for roots up in the water column, and new growth at the very top of the plant. Trim all the stuff underneath those roots, replant it back down, you'll be A-OK. -okay. Now in general, whenever I get new stem plants, especially if they come in a bundle, but if they come in a pot as well, like if uh, Aquarium Co-op, for example, never does bundles, it's always in pots. I, a lot of times, buy my plants at Aquarium Co-op. When it comes to my like more generic stuff, instead of like hunting down something crazy and weird, Instead of planting it right away, if it's in a pot, just take the plant in its whole pot and put it in your tank. And the reason why we do this is we're going to give that plant time to adjust to your water conditions. Now, if it's in a bundle, uh, make sure that, that that rubber band, if it's on it or if it's got a lead weight, whatever weight it has, is not too tight on the stems. Because if it's applying like a crush force to it, we risk that plant having problems. But we need it just to hold it just enough. Put it in the tank. Same thing as in the pot. We're going to give it a little bit of time, wait for seeing that new growth and even some of those aerial roots. Or if the, the stems at the bottom stay nice and healthy, we're looking for roots down low to start growing. Once we see new roots and some new growth, that has plant has basically converted to our water system and now it's ready to plant. Until then, you actually can risk if you plant it right away and not all the time. Most of the time it's okay, but you can risk choking that portion of that plant out and it doesn't grow its roots properly because it's struggling to get uh nutrients down to the plant right and it's a it's a weird process certain stems are a little more notorious for doing this uh, the things in like the money wart and penny wart family are a little more finicky when it comes to being an immersed grown plant and converting than some of the others like pocus daemon almost never cares and so it's like bulletproof um but certain plants are a little more finicky so that's most likely what's happening. And basically, it's just a matter of patience. Make sure you have nutrients. It's getting some good light. Uh, if you have CO2, that's going to help you a ton. If you don't have CO2, you don't need it for that plant. Just get a little patience. Once you see new growth and look for those, like, and they're going to be really small, right? Those white roots out in the, up in the water column. Cut just underneath those roots. Get those roots planted down in the substrate. You'll be A-OK. -okay. Uh, Gorsim, any updates on your master grower program? <laughs> we'll, stop, we'll stop bugging if you're like X months away. Uh, so right now I've sent over some extra spec details to the developer. Um, we're going with a specific platform that the, the dev hasn't necessarily done before, but uh, she's taking, she was taking basically the first three weeks 
uh, free of charge, mind you. I actually, uh, like, upfront paid the person just because I wanted to be nice. Um, but <laughs> not the whole thing, but more of a, um, a, a partial payment to, like, just make sure that person knows, like, I'm serious and all that kind of stuff, right? Um, and also, I was like, hey, have a little extra money. You're doing some stuff. Take care of yourself. But getting used to all the kind of the, the hooks about that platform and what we're doing to make sure they know everything they need and are familiar with it so that when we get into the active development where there's back and forth between us a lot, um, there isn't like big delays of, I need to go figure this part out. I need to go figure that part out. I need to go figure this part out. And that's fine with me. Um, it's it's not going to be as fast as I could have with some other companies, right, that like basically all suggested the same platform. <laughs> so it's part of why we chose it. Um, but... You know, it's someone local, it's someone I can work hand in hand with, and eventually down the road, after we launch the first part of the program, we can in theory expand upon it, add new features and stuff like that, and working uh, kind of hand in hand with one person just feels feels a little better than like uh, generic company X that just like is like, yeah, we'll do it this and we'll bang it out this fast and you're done, right? You know, it's it feels a little more personal that way, and that's kind of the, the touch I want. I, I would rather have a singular developer who's a little more uh, a ment mentally, emotionally, whatever you want to call it, invested in this little program than like just a company who's like, yeah, we can bang out your stupid aquarium project. It'll take us this amount of time. <laughs> you know, it's just one of those, like, I just want somebody who's a little more uh, into like passion project kind of stuff. So hopefully, um, I sent a spec over. Hopefully, I need to like follow up with her, but I should hopefully have a, a better understanding of a timeline either next week or the week after. I'm being super patient, mostly because I'm working a, a ludicrous amount <laughs> on other things, and my brain is scattered all over the place. <laughs> uh, Cheryl, I wish you would stop calling it lazy or busy. Uh, busy people learn quickly to cut corners where they safely can. Uh, you know, that's that's part of it. But um, it's, let me put it this way, it's lazy compared to what I would like to do. I would like to be more thorough about certain things, but yeah. <laughs> uh, da, 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 da. Okay, so talking, going back to Steven's question about the furts, uh, it's just one of those things that I forget to do, alternate daily furts, so I try to consolidate, streamline things just for my ADD brain. Totally understand. Uh, and, like, I, I do that kind of stuff too, right? Like, I'll forget to, I'll, I'll tell myself, oh, don't forget, you got to fertilize tomorrow. And then I'll wake up in the morning, I'll do all my morning routine, and I'll be like, I am, like, already uh, way behind schedule. I need to get the heck out of Dodge. <laughs> and I'll, like, run out without, and I'll tell myself, like, when I get home, I'll feed the fish. But then I'll forget to fertilize plants until, like, three days later. <sighs> Maybe that's part of why uh, some of my plants are doing, like, not as great in the sense of they're just like they're just there <laughs> and other plants are doing phenomenal <laughs> uh, like I have a ton of boost flowering right now in the running river tank and it's it's fantastic because like seeing all those different flowers like how certain ones are huge and other ones are like tiny it's great <laughs> it's just great it makes you feel good <laughs> alright I'm going to catch up on chat I know I'm behind I'm trying quirky lemon are the differences in care between boost varieties? And I'm gonna I'm gonna pound this in. There was another question earlier, and I, I'm my brain literally just like got triggered to remember this. What's a, a great beginner boost? So I'm gonna combine these together, right? So number one uh, is: Are there differences in care between different boost varieties? Yes and no. Really, the only difference comes to how you divide them. So like, Pink Lady, Silver Stein, Black Marble. Uh, Skeleton King, all the ones that have that really thick rhizome tend to have larger long leaves that come off of a bigger stem that they, they tend to grow more like vertical in how their rhizome grows compared to something like, say, Green Wavy or uh, any of the brownies where they, they tend to have a, a thinner, shorter, like long rhizome that sits naturally more horizontal how we divide them and get extra plants out of them is is a little bit different process and it's not like it's not that different i want to be clear here it's basically similar but instead what we're looking for in those bigger thicker rhizomes is they'll naturally branch off and we're trying to break those branches away where we can just divide the rhizome in more of our standard 
boosts, right? So uh, that's really the only difference. As far as care, they all like softer water. They all really appreciate CO2, although they don't need it. Uh, but just if you want to grow it at some reasonable speed, a little bit of CO2 goes a long way, especially if you want to flower it. In general, they don't want super bright direct light. They tend to appreciate more subdued lighting, but they need slightly longer exposure times because where they come from naturally, you're talking Borneo. That's a place that's going to get 12, 14 hours of light a day in the winter, right? <laughs> they get a lot of light. Uh, but they get shaded light because they tend to be in areas where there's lots of tree cover and stuff like that. So it's not this like huge direct light. Uh, and, and other than that, like they just appreciate a reasonable amount of flow. They all come from like stream and river systems. Almost none of them come from lakes. So they come from areas where there's naturally a bit of flow. And what that helps to do is prevent detritus buildup and, and thus algae getting on your leaves, right? It keeps those leaves beautiful, gets you that nice sheen. Um, certain ones tend to have slightly different desires when it comes to our nutrients but if you're doing like an all-in-one or just generically dosing all the things we should usually dose you don't really have to worry about it. it's not something like similar to java fern where it's like i'm a potassium hog i need a ton of potassium or monte carlo where it's like there's not enough calcium in the water i'm just gonna die on you <laughs> because i love calcium but more just like some of the ones that are a little red they appreciate slightly more iron some of the ones that like the brownie series or the, the ghosts and the phantoms where you get those like cool, super speckly patterns. Those you like need to shade out to near eternal darkness to actually show what you tend to see <laughs> in like all the uh, color altered photography that's online. But yeah, I mean, really, they all don't need too much difference. The big thing is the um, more common stuff like your green wavies and um, like the red or super red mini, they've got like a million names for them. The, the ones that tend to have your more teardrop shaped leaves are all kind of your simpler ones, right? And then the stuff that's like green wavy, green wavy is probably the easiest. And that's just because we've had it in the hobby the longest and we've, we've figured out the most about it. It's the least demanding of all of them. But any of the ones that are like that, they're all pretty much the same. The big difference that I would avoid, avoid Skeleton King. And and I'll explain in just a sec. Avoid some of the bigger leafed Anubias that have like long stems and then big leaves. So like your Skeleton Kings, but similar to that. This can include things like Pink Lady, Silver Stein, Black Marble. Ones that look like, if you look all these up, they all look kind of similar. They have those big thick rhizomes. They have longer stems and do a bigger leaf. Not always a huge leaf, but the reason why I say this, these ones tend to be more demanding, and more importantly, these are the ones that are less likely to be successful in fully submerged water. Skeleton King, especially the Black Skeleton King, is notorious for this. This plant is basically only grown immersed, and it is very, very hard for us Aquarists to convert it to a fully submerged plant. Now, I happen to be doing pretty good with a pair of um, green skeleton kings and dark skeleton kings, which is just a darker green. It's not the black. I'm doing very well with the ones that I have. And part of that is because I am forcing it to get more light as if it were in a more immersed setup, right? And I'm pushing CO2 at it in a tank that doesn't have too much demand. So it's getting a lot of nutrients. It's getting CO2. It's got lots of flow. So it's getting kind of everything it needs. And happenstancely, some of it is flowering for me. So that tells me, like, it's very happy, right? It's doing what it needs to be because it's flowering underwater. But in general, almost all the boost is really simple. If you're looking for an easy one, just go find Green Wavy. It's, it's the easiest. After that, I would look at... Um, I would avoid the brownies. The brownies can be a little difficult. If you're going to do any of the brownies, do either brownie brown or brownie blue. Those are the two probably least demanding. Don't don't go for like Skeleton King or Brownie Ghost or any of this like weird crazy nonsense. Uh, the, the other one that can be kind of simple is Catherine A. Um, and that's only because it's just like, it's like Green Wavy, but a much finer leaf. And I know this is, this is babbling lots at you. Lots. But part of the problem with Boost is that like, I swear seven species of boost out there are all the exact same one. They just come from different catch locations because we've never done the science to prove which ones are which. And that it, part of the 
extravagant names in boosts is a marketing tactic. It is purely a marketing tactic. So there you go. There's all sorts of stuff on boost that you probably <laughs> got more than you might have needed. <laughs> ah, woo, Jerry. Ranunculus inundated. Does it need CO2 or will it just take longer to settle in without it? Um, I, in my limited experience, because I haven't really played with that plan a lot, but I've had friends that have, in order to get it really happy the way that we see it, it almost always needs some amount of CO2. However, to my knowledge, it is not a, like, will die without CO2 plant. How It just is a lot more finicky. So, uh, low CO2 could go a long way. And this could be something like a passive CO2 system. Or uh, even... <laughs> I hate to say this because I, I think they're, they're more a gimmick than anything else, but they do actually work. Those little CO2 tabs, which all they're really doing is they're, they're creating the same effect that causes carbonated water. <laughs> That's how they're getting CO2. And, you know, it's like a, it's like an Alka-Seltzer tab almost. <laughs> but uh, they, you know, they can actually be effective in very small tanks. So that's that's an option. But in theory, should not need it as long as it's getting decent nutrients and some relatively good light. Because the, the leaves are kind of fine and yet not all at the same time uh, because of the way that the, the leaf texture and pattern is for that plant. Do, 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 do. Uh, Fishy Mailman wanted to mention that he still loves his Godzilla. I think Godzilla is one of the better, tar larger leaf booses that's actually kind of easier. So, um, in that regard, it, it kind of breaks the rules, but it can also be a jerk at the same time. <laughs> it's just one of those, it's one of those things. Uh, it, it likes to be a jerk, but at the same time, can be one of the, the few easy, big leafed, uh, and it's it's a gorgeous plant once it's happy, man. It's so pretty. A lot of the boosts is like that, though. Kelly Foreman. Oh, boy. Any advice on staghorn algae? Oh, boy. <laughs> I have highlight CO2, easy green for birds. Does anything eat this stuff? It's so gross. Yes, there is something that eats staghorn algae. Hold on. I remember this because I remember reading it and being like, Really? And uh, I, I was surprised. So, Siamese algae eaters, young ones, will eat staghorn algae. But you got to get the little ones. The guys that are like are teeny tiny and little sticks that have the really voracious appetites. Um, also, I think it's nearites, but it might have been ram's horns. Uh, it's, it, nearites or ramshorns, one of the two snails will eat it if you're willing to put up with snails. Uh, but you can get SAEs to eat it. It's just because it's tough, you have to have like the really voracious eaters. And then usually what you do is you don't feed the tank. I know this sounds crazy, but what you would do is you like get SAEs. You'd move your fish if you or, or just not feed them for a couple days and they'll tolerate it. And they'll just go like crazy. And they'll eat that algae because they got no other source of food. There's other ways to deal with it, but like if you want a fish to deal with it, that's your best bet. All right, uh, Danny, any tips on growing red root floaters? Iron. Uh, honestly, like most of my experience with red root floaters has been really simple. Have a consistent. Uh, amount of nitrate in the water. So if you're if you're dosing your fertilizers only like once a week, spread that fertilizer out over the course of the week instead, and do like a small dose every day or every other day. That tends to be extremely helpful for dealing with uh, some of the slightly more finicky floaters. But like even red root floaters, a little bit of iron goes a long way. And then just making sure that. Um, you're, you, if you have lids on your tank, you want to bring your water level down more. Because in any floating plant, if you have lids and they're not exposed to open atmosphere, that excess moisture on the top of their leaves actually hurts them more than you might think. It can cause even some of the like most notoriously 
prolific, so like dwarf water lettuce, for example, plants to die. Because they're not designed to deal with all that extra moisture. They want those dry tops to their leaves, and that helps them consume CO2 from the atmosphere. When they're wet, they can't consume the CO2 from the atmosphere and accelerate that growth. Little trick. Helps a ton. Almost all floaters, that's the case. There's like maybe two examples where it isn't. And that would be when you float water wisteria or um, water sprite. And that's because they can handle full immersion. Where all your true floating plants cannot handle full immersion. Do, 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 do. Uh, Rescue Dog Treats, does Easy Green have enough potassium in it for most local waters for Java Fern? Uh, so the only thing that I tend to do, because I'm, I'm an all-in-one fur doser, is that let's say I have a um, a 40-gallon tank with a, a decent amount of Java Fern in it, and I'm not using CO2. Instead of four pumps per week at low light or doing that twice for medium light, I will... Uh, basically alternate two pumps, three pumps, two pumps, three pumps, and spread that dose out at a slightly higher amount over more days. So my goal is I'm actually overdosing my efforts, right, by doing that. But what it does is it adds that little bit of extra micros in the water. The other way you can get around this is just get like some Flourish Trace or potassium if you really want just potassium. But I, I actually like Trace a little bit more because it gives you kind of all the micros in one shot if you're going for a liquid. And yeah, it makes things more complicated. I understand that. But in general, I have had pretty good results with Easy Green. I just kind of overdose it by knowing that, like, this tank handles so much because it's densely planted, so I will add a little bit extra or dose a smaller amount in more successions than I would normally. So if normally I was only dosing twice a week... I would instead dose slightly more than that four or five times a week. Something like that. Tends to do the trick for me, and there's like nothing in my water, so I have to put stuff in. Have to, have to. All right. I'm almost catching up with chat. Can you believe it? I caught up with chat. So if I missed anybody's question, at Bentley Pasco, go ahead and repost it. Uh, I I tend to, to worry that I... Uh, if I caught up with chat, it means I missed something. <laughs> oh, no, I've missed something. I just found a question I missed. <laughs> JT, have you kept Fissidens nobilis? I bought a 3x3 three three mat seven months ago, and it looks exactly like the same when I bought it. Any advice to promote growth? Um, so with moss, and there was another question about moss too. The best moss for my driftwood, I think, was some what someone asked. So I'm going to handle both these together. And also Blake's Aquatics. Hi, buddy. Been a while since I've seen you. How you doing? Saw you're climbing up there in the subscriber count. Good work. So in the case of almost all moss, if you're having trouble with your moss, get one of those like uh, suction cup ledges and put the moss close to the surface of water. Or the option. If you have a sponge filter, I know I've taught this trick before, but I'm going to teach it again. Put it either right by the sponge or attach it to the sponge. Why? Most of our mosses, right, they tend to do best in moist areas but not fully submerged. So part of how we kind of cheat this is that the big problem when they sit in a lot of places is they'll get a lot of detritus in them that we don't necessarily see. And that hinders their growth. So the way that we counteract this or, or kick it so to speak into high gear is we use flow to our advantage uh, we we let that flow help keep the plant clean right to help us get the detritus off and more importantly when we start bringing it up toward the water surface or where we have lots of oxygen moving through stuff through when we're pulling air in through uh, an air hose or something like that there's nitrogen there's CO2, there's all sorts of stuff in that air. It's not just pure oxygen, right? And we can use that to feed those plants. And that really boosts 
moss a lot more than you might think. It helps a ton to do that. And moss does like light, but I've also seen that you can do moss with almost no light. It'll grow like crazy. It's kind of a... Uh, you, you can play this careful game, right? Because moss... Moss can grow in very, very low light situations, but certain moss lasts a lot of light. Uh, the nobilis tends to like a little bit more light. It likes a little direct light, but too much light can give you algae. So that's where that flow comes into place and helps us out. Okay? So those are those would be what I would suggest. Now, in the case of the person asking about best moss to attach to wood, I would say, personally, Christmas moss. And the only reason why I say this is that Christmas moss grows a little more dense than Java moss. And it tends to grab on a bit better. Now, there are some other mosses that will um, really grab on very, very well. You could look at like willow moss or flame moss or spiky moss. Uh, the it's Spiky and flame are kind of the same, right? They're Usually they are the exact same species of moss. It just depends on what nickname people call it. These all naturally grow on wood really well. So, you know, use a little bit of like fishing twine or something to tie it down in the first place, let it grow in, and then it should be fine. But if you want to just be simple, Christmas moss. Looks good, less finicky. Uh, I would avoid fissidens until you get a little more experience because fissidens can be. A little bit of a jerk, uh, in the sense that fissidens loves flow. All the fissidens love flow. And if they're not in direct flow, they struggle. But when they're in direct flow, they do amazing. There's ways to cheat that. Certainly ways to cheat it. But if you want easy, I like Christmas moss personally. And like a great example, co-op for a while, and I, I think they're still doing them. Candy can correct me if I'm wrong, but they have those like bridges built of, uh, I think it was coconut husk or, or something similar where they covered them in Christmas moss that they were getting from a distributor at one point. And those things are great. Like, they just show exactly how Christmas moss does really well on wood. You just tie it down, you let it settle in, it grabs on its own, and it just builds this cool little structure. Um, and lots of lots of aquascapers tend to use Christmas moss because it is very, very easy and does very, very well when it's attached to things. So hopefully that helps. Now, if you want to do like, how's what's the best way to apply it to all your wood? Um, there's a really, really great video from Green Aqua that shows how they do moss, which is basically like they cut it into like tons of tiny, tiny particles, almost like, um, what's the word I'm looking for? The stuff you put on trees, flocking, right? If you're if you're familiar with like the white fake snow that you put on trees, it's called flocking. Uh, for those who've ever done miniatures uh, and you're doing fake grass on your your miniatures, that's also called flock. Um, you cut it into small pieces, you lay down glue, and you just press it into the glue, and it will grow from there and be okay. Then you just like keep pushing, basically mats of this finely chopped up moss in, let it get into its amount. Easy peasy. <laughs> it does its thing. <laughs> PCFR. How do I ID Moss to know what I'm selling people? I don't have a good answer for you. Uh, I'm terrible at IDing Moss. So I'm the like worst person to tell you how to ID Moss. Other than label your tanks. And only put one Moss in each tank. Don't put multiple Mosses in a tank. That's the way I would do it. Uh, frog and Stork. Will Purigen infiltration absorb fertilizer like Seachem Flourish? According to Seachem, Purigen does not absorb the various chemicals that are in uh, our fertilizers. So according to Seachem, the answer is no. Do I know that to be true for certain? Not at all. I have no clue. <laughs> I have no clue. But that's what they claim. 
Lots of your your big aquascaping channels use Pyrogen in everything, and they don't seem to have problems. So there's that. Uh, Omar, a chop it like pesto, and three months later, presto. <laughs> oh, that's good. <laughs> Frankie Fins, have you had experience with Anubius Nana Petite White? I have a piece the size smaller than a pea. That's really tiny. That must have come out of like a, a tissue culture or something. Um, how do I not kill it? Light. CO2 flow in that order. Uh, so Anubius white in order to maintain the white, which is uh, it can lose the white and never come back. I've, I've done Anubius white, marble, pinto, and stardust are the, the, the four varieties of white that I've grown. Um, and basically all of them require highlight. It will go dark without light. It'll turn back green and it'll lose its white, and that white will never come back. Uh, it's some you can get it to come back. It's not never, but it's really hard to get it to come back. Second, it really does best with CO two. Without CO two, it struggles a lot in order to maintain that white coloration because it needs the CO two to handle the excessive amounts of light that it's going to deal with third flow and the reason why we do flow is we want to prevent any detritus buildup on the leaves that cause algae and start coating the leaves preventing it from being able to do all the processes that it needs for photosynthesis so there you go those those three those are your thing it can be really tough i will admit but it's definitely doable twin city guppies hi kang good to see you buddy I haven't seen you in one of my streams in, like, a month? That might be wrong. I feel like it's been a while. Then again, I can't tell time anymore because, you know, human malware has just ruined my perception of what reality is and how time passes. Things seem really, really fast, or, or they seem really, really slow at the same time. I don't know. <laughs> I don't know. Uh, so Kathy Kirkman saying that uh, Dustin had a Moss video recently that helped identify and that was pretty good. Good to know. Good to know. Uh, Mike Baker. Do I have to move Fry out of a Zist Tumbler after hatching or can I grow them in there one to two weeks first? If so, how can I feed them without the Fry getting out? Uh, no. So what I would do is I would get a breeder box uh this has that really nice internal one that has the same like clip on hanging system as the the this tumbler um or you can get like the marina hang-ons anything like that and i basically go from the hatcher into the breeder box to keep them separate that way you can easily feed them it basically comes down to it's very hard to feed them inside that canister without it getting so dirty that it then causes problems and, and, you know, depending on the fish, they, they can last in there for a bit because some of them take a while to go through their egg sacs. But in general, I would say uh, move the fish out of the tumbler as soon as they've hatched and you see if they have a, a yolk sac, they no longer have a yolk sac. Um, but as long as they have a yolk sac, keep them in there because they're going to feed off of that. But the second they need to actually feed off other things... That's when I would move them out of the tumbler and into either the tank itself, if they can, or a breeder box, if it's something like a, a fish that's going to get predated upon by its parents. Like, plecos don't usually predate upon each other. So, that's, in my case, I just put them straight in the parent tank and I don't care. But, in the case of some of the other fish that are out there where they might, or they might uh, bully those baby fish, then yeah, move them into something like a, a hang-on breeder box and you should be okay. Twin Cities Guppies. I like that I got a question from Kang. This makes me feel good. <laughs> a, a true a true guppy connoisseur. Bentley, is it true that moss grows better with a lot of water flow? Okay. I cannot scientifically prove this. However, it has been my experience. When I put moss into flow, it grows phenomenally better. 
I have had Java moss look like Christmas moss. It was so healthy in water flow. And then I've had it stringy and blah looking like we normally see it without very much flow. And I grew a giant ball of it in both cases. And both both times I took it in, when I, I had excesses of, of moss that I didn't need for myself. I, I'll very often take them up to like the co-op or a local shop, uh, whichever shop I'm going to at that time. And I, I remember specifically I took in two different balls of, of Java moss to the co-op. And they looked at one. They were like, okay, Java moss split into portions. Looked at the other and went, is this Christmas moss? And I said, no, it's Java moss. And I went, how? Because it didn't look like Java moss. It's not like the thin, stringy stuff we're used to. If you get it going right, dude, Java moss looks great. It'll look start looking like Christmas moss. But you can do the same thing with Christmas moss. Christmas moss looks amazing. <laughs> so it's one of those things. Flow, in my experience, has always been like the absolute how to put this it's like the the finishing touch of taking something from it's doing good to it's doing amazing when it comes to moss some mosses you know those crazy crazy finicky ones get a little get a little angry but most of them they love flow <laughs> Orphan Slayer. I'm not familiar with many other plants that aren't on the aquarium co-op. <laughs> what are low-light beginner plants that you can probably find at a local fish store? Um, so some of the stuff that co-op doesn't tend to carry that you'll find more commonly in um, like bundles at a lot of at a lot of fish stores. Uh, things like um, Creeping Jenny is a great example. That's a that's a plant that that's the common name and most commonly what they're going to call it in a store. They won't call it by its scientific. Uh, that's a really good plant. Something like um, Ludwigia repens is a really common like simple low demand red plant. That's a stem. Almost all these are going to be stems because most of the stuff that like you get epiphytes and stuff like that uh, maybe maybe will bite us because co-op doesn't always carry bulbitis and I think it's just because it's hard for them to source in enough quantity because it's a slower grower a lot like uh, some of the, the other fern plants but yeah I mean those are probably the, the three that I can think of off the top of my head they are easy uh, you can get some that are slightly harder that will grow in low demand tanks but um, those are like the, the easy ones that immediately come to mind if you can find it uh it, this this is where this gets a little tough because it can be uh, it's not a very common plant anymore and it's typically called by its old name that's new name but you want Pogostamon stellata which is the correct name so not stellatus octopus that's that's the one we're used to stellata it is most commonly known by its old name which is Yastralis stellata uh, let me type that in chat because it's it's weird. Uh, make sure I can type around my microphone. So there's Yastralis stellata. I know that, like, off the top of my head, Dustin's fish tank still calls it Yastralis stellata, even though it's been reclassified and it was done years ago as a Pogo Um But, yeah, so here's a great example. Cheryl, Cheryl Evans is talking about we grow golden creeping jenny, which uh, it's actually the variety I like a little bit more if you can find it. Outdoors here. I put it in my outdoor tub. Yeah, it's phenomenal. Uh, other than that, like, other plants that, like, co-op doesn't typically keep that are... Nigh bulletproof hornwort. I love hornwort. I love that plant. And then sometimes I hate it. <laughs> but it's a really, really good, simple plant. It has a very unique uh, leaf texture and look to it. Uh, it looks like a plastic plant because, like, one of the most common plastic plants is designed to look like hornwort. It's phenomenal for shrimp. It's really great for baby guppy fry to hide in. Uh, it can float. It can be planted like a stem. Like, it's just super versatile. Super easy. Great plant. Uh, Paul Sotero is suggesting an acarus. I will never suggest an acarus because I hate that plant. You heard me. I hate it. I can't stand that plant. Mostly because when it's uh, when it's immersed, it's like thicker and looks cooler. But when it's submerged, it's like this very thin plant. It's not as happy. It's not as happy looking. And I just, I can't stand it. <laughs> I like hornwort so much more. And hornwort is the better version of guppy grass. I wouldn't necessarily say that, but like I, I, I like hornwort more than guppy grass personally. 
Uh, I think Gumpy Grass has its place because it grows so fast and is so good at absorbing nitrates uh, that it's really good in, like, tub situations. So, like, what Corey is doing, right, at his new uh, urban fish farm or whatever the heck he's calling it, uh, his new fish room at his new place, those big, like, 300-gallon tubs that he uses, man... <laughs> <laughs> Hornwort doesn't fill it as as well as guppy grass does, but guppy grass is fantastic in that kind of setting. And yeah, anacris works really well in outdoors too. Don't get me wrong, but yeah, I'm I'm just like I I don't like anacris. <laughs> it's a personal thing. Also, it's considered a noxious weed, and it's actually not supposed to be sold in basically the entirety of the United States. That might not be something you didn't know. Technically. I think there's only like two states where it's not on the noxious weed list where uh, you can be fined significantly for selling it. Things you didn't know about, right? Anywho, uh, make sure uh, one more one more from John Kim. I'm going to cover this one, but before I do, I just want to thank you guys for tuning in. Sorry for being a little late, technical difficulties, all that kind of nonsense. Uh, we have Dr. Black coming up next. If you want to catch another stream with my Australian friend, go check him out. He's starting in like five-ish minutes typically. We'll see if that changes. But let me get to John's question real fast, and then we will wrap this bad boy up. Enjoyed your video on budget lights, which helped me determine the lights to buy. Happened to go with JCMP. Uh, thanks. Besides pothos or frog bits, are there any other non-submerged plants to consume high nitrates? Yeah. So... Um, it technically we think of it as a submerged plant, but we can grow it floating and that would be either water sprite or water wisteria. The other thing that you could look into if you can find it, I need to get it's a, it's scientific name, but it's called commonly just Asian water grass. It's this really cool plant. Uh, Hygror. Oh man, I'm going to mess this up. And I used to know this really well. Hygroriza aristata. I'm going to put this in chat for you. But uh, here's the common name and official name. It's actually a super, super cool plant. And I swear that one of the pictures here actually comes from one of my tanks. That looks oddly like a picture I took. Um, it's probably not, but you know. <laughs> um, it's, a, it's a really, really cool plant. I, I'd love to add this picture real fast to show you guys. Do, 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 do. And there's some other um, plants similar to like pothos that don't go in water that can grow out of water and do really well um, that are pretty big nitrate hogs. But I couldn't tell you off the top of my head because that's not like the those aren't those don't tend to be the type of plants that I do a lot of stuff with um, just because that's you know. Not what I'm always, like, going crazy for. Where did this put this? Oh, there it is. Found it. It's going to look right. Bam. Here it is. This is Asian water grass, by the way. It's a really cool floating plant. It has a very, very different leaf texture than most floating plants. I love this stuff a ton. I had it for quite a while. I dispersed it all over my club. And then I got rid of it while I was doing a bunch of stuff because I was like, I can get it eventually again. And then I, I haven't seen it since, and I've kind of wanted it again. <laughs> but it grows these nice roots that come down, uh, and they're a bit more robust than, like, your your other floating plants. Um, it just has a very different leaf texture. It looks really cool. It's a very, very cool plant. It's very easy because it's a floater. It really doesn't take very much. Uh, it comes in these, like, longer strands, uh, with this kind of like thicker, almost reed-like stem to it. Uh, it's just, it's a neat plant. It's a little unique for a floater in aquariums, and you don't see it very often. So if you have it, a lot of times you'll get other plant people who'll be like, what is that and where did you get it? And it's kind of a nice, it, it feels nice when you do that with other plant nerds. You know, this is one of that. Uh, and ginger, that is a Panagitan. So, technically. Uh, yeah, it's... Uh, G E T O N, and I A P O N O. I think right. Yeah, A P O N O G E T O N. Aponagitan. 
is the the subclass all the bulb variety plants most almost all of them are Ponagetans. anyway um we got dr back very very shortly guys thank you so much for tuning in i guess okay hold on one more question i can grab fast mike stambaugh do you have any tricks to keep rainbows from digging up small plant bulbs like a parklea longifolia uh, man, there was a question about pitfall staff and Ridley Eye uh, earlier too that I, I now want to answer, but I don't want to go too long. Um, so in general, with something like that, I don't have good ones. The way that I would do this is that I would. Um, this is gonna sound weird, but basically take the bulb, right? Use a little bit of um, like fine fishing line, and tie a plant weight to it underneath where you're hiding it right and that helps weigh it down so that even if they dig it up it drops right back in place on the substrate and can dig its roots back in that's like the best answer i have for you but like that this is one of the biggest problems with rainbows if you don't have something that roots really really well rainbows will just like sometimes unintentionally rip it up because they they sit and spar down low and do all that crazy nonsense uh, stress, uh, one more question and we'll probably get rolling. For those of you who I didn't answer your question, if you still have questions, shoot me an email. It's bentley.pasco at gmail.com. I will put this into chat. I am happy to answer your questions. If you email me, please don't contact me on Facebook. Please don't contact me on Instagram. Um, just like I get a lot of people who do. And like, I, I, I beg you, beg you, beg you. If you do have questions, email me because it's much easier for me to, look at something on Facebook, see it and forget it in the place of my day because I don't have time to answer stuff. Where an email, I leave things I haven't touched unread. And then I, when I get time at like lunch or something, I go through stuff and I answer it. So just a, a tip for the wise, like people ask me questions on other social media things. Like you've probably noticed very early, I used to answer a lot. Now I answer very little because I'm just crazy busy and it's easier for me to manage email. Like I have just space on stuff when I'm at, going like 9 million miles an hour at work. Uh, but to stress out, let's answer that question real fast. Do you know any online place to get some frog bits and some duckweed? So very commonly, a lot of the floating plants aren't sold online because they don't ship very well. Uh, you'll find like people on eBay or Etsy, stuff like that, the individual people who will sell them. But it's, it's so hard to ship it and have it survive shipping which is why most of your retailers like Aquarium Co-op is probably the best example because Corey talks about this all the time. They they have so much trouble shipping it that it becomes something where all they do is lose money shipping it so they don't carry it anymore. You might try somewhere like uh, Dustin's Fish Tanks where they have like a really large inventory, but even then, I, I really doubt they ship floating plants. Uh, it's just something that's not super common. You can find retailers online, but they're not always the best. Uh, just a heads up, just be prepared for that kind of stuff. But yeah, a lot of times it's something you have to kind of find locally uh, in order to get that going. And yeah, there's there's ways to ship it correctly. It just, it's troublesome. <laughs> Are you sure you want duckweed? <laughs> what a question. Anyway, guys, thank you so much. If I missed your question, shoot me an email. I'll happily get back to you uh, within hopefully two to three days. So don't do any emergencies to me. That's that's usually the worst. Uh, but, uh, you know, my email's in chat, bentley.pasco at gmail.com. Feel free to shoot me an email. I'll get back to you in two, three days, typically. As always, guys, thank you so much for watching. And stay awesome. <laughs>